Okay, so in this video, we're going to be talking about cell size and uh, surface area to volume ratios. This is specifically for the AP Biology Curriculum uh, Unit 2, uh, Section 2.3, or Topic 2.3. So let's go ahead and uh, first talk about cells and how they come in different sizes. So when we look at uh, eukaryotic cells compared to prokaryotic cells, so here we have um, our large prokaryotic cell. Woo! Eukaryotic cell. And then here we have our tiny prokaryotic cell. And so when we talk about cells, they come in different shapes, different sizes. We have our large animal and plant cells. We have our single cellular prokaryotes. Um, we have yeast that are single cell eukaryotes. We have neurons with all of their dendrites and extensions. We have skin cells, liver cells. We have so many different kinds of cells that come in all shapes and sizes. However, a similarity that they all have in common is that they all are surrounded by a cell membrane. And it's through that cell membrane that the nutrients and the requirements for that cell's life enter the cell. And that's also where wastes are gonna be sent out of the cell or exit the cell through that cell membrane. So we wanna think about the requirements for that cell um, compared to the amount of cell membrane that it really has. And so if we think about this large eukaryotic cell here, and we think about a cell's organelles and the amount of oxygen it requires or glucose it requires, um, for example, for like the mitochondria within the cell. Um, oh, this is, looks like it's a plant cell uh, with these chloroplasts here. I just got this off of Google Images but it seems odd to me. I feel like we should have some like green cell walls going on here, but that's okay. And so um, anyway, when we talk about the oxygen and the glucose required um, by these mitochondria, uh, they have to enter the cell by diffusion, not have to, but they enter a cell by diffusion. And so if a cell were to get so large, like a beach ball, um, the mitochondria located within the center would be very difficult for the oxygen to get there by random diffusion. It would take a very long time. So when we think about um, the amount of volume in a cell compared to its surface area, uh, we can see these two images here. So they both have the same amount of surface area. However, in the cubes, oh my gosh, they both have the same amount of volume, sorry, same volume. However, the surface area is gonna be greater in the clump of cubes. And that's because each individual has, each individual cube there has its own like cell membrane or surface area. And so here is a time-lapse of the lab we did in class where we had that um, agar uh, that was, oh, let's see if it plays. Mm. Okay, let me escape out of my PowerPoint. Oh, there we go. And so um, we dropped them into vinegar, which was an acid. And as the vinegar diffuses into the cube, you can see it change color. So you notice in the smaller cube, um, diffusion, it was more efficient. Where now in the larger cube, if there was a mitochondria, um, like in the center in that dark purple area, it still would not have its oxygen. And so the smaller um, cells have a greater surface area compared to the volume, and that makes it more efficient. So I don't know if we can play this again. So again, focus on the small cell or cube compared to the large one, and you can see the efficiency of nutrients diffusing into the cell. Um, like comparatively speaking, it's more efficient the smaller a cell is. Um, and this is why there are limits to the size of cells and how large they can actually become. And so when we look at this, we can use math to find that surface area to volume ratios. Um, and with that, um, you want to think about, let's see if I can move this, uh, here, if you find the surface area, um, when we talk about surface area to volume, you take the surface area of the cell or of the object and you divide it by the total volume. So when you do, here we get a six, this would be like a six to one, 
surface area to volume ratio. Um, and over here, you get a 1.2 surface area to volume ratio. The sixth means it has a larger surface area compared to the volume. Where here in this cube, you're like, well, it's massive. That's got to be better. Not necessarily. If you calculate the surface area, you divide it by the volume, you see it has less surface area compared to the volume, making it less efficient. So just think back to those purple and pink cubes and visualize how being smaller is going to be more efficient and better for obtaining nutrients and eliminating wastes. And when you look at that number mathematically, it has a larger surface area compared to the volume um, when compared to a larger uh, cell. Now, if you look at this over here, if you have that same volume of 125, but they each have their own cell membrane, you can see how it um, increases the efficiency of obtaining nutrients and eliminating wastes. And now each of those individual cubes, surface area to volume ratios are larger at six than compared to this middle one here. All right, now sometimes though in um, the body and different organisms, we can see different shapes of cells. And so um, here, I love this actually, when you think about the cells lining our intestines, they have these little microvilli, like little finger-like projections that are basically increasing the surface area of um, our intestines. If you were to iron them flat, it would cover like a tennis court. Uh, I think I heard that on Bill Nye like a decade ago. So I don't know, maybe don't fact check or don't quote me, fact check instead. Um, but anyway, when you look at these little like finger-like projections, it totally increases the amount of surface area for diffusion, for obtaining nutrients. When you eat your food and it travels through your intestines, like that's how your nutrients enter into your body. It's gonna be through these little microvilli. So these cells lining the edges is where those nutrients are gonna be absorbed. And so when you think about um, different cell shapes, any time you see a cell that's shaped differently, like this one is a neuron, this is what your brain cell looks like, all of these projections definitely increase the surface area of this cell. And so um, we can see it in our red blood cells. Imagine if our red blood cells were spheres, I don't know how to draw a sphere, um, compared to this Frisbee-like shape. So by flattening your blood cells, when you have this like little divot right here, um, that is increasing the surface area compared to the volume. Now, if you think deeply, like why would that matter? Well, our blood cells are what carry our oxygen. So by increasing the surface area compared to the volume, it gives it more like room for oxygen to diffuse into that blood cell to be carried to the rest of the body. Uh, we also see this um, like increase in surface area in uh, germinating roots on little seedlings. If you like start a garden or something, take some lettuce or radish seeds and get them wet on a paper towel for a few days. And you'll see little tiny like white hairs germ like grow on the roots. And at first you might think it's a fungus, but those are all extensions. Those are root hairs to increase the surface area um, for like taking in uh, water, oxygen uh, from the environment for that developing root. And so here you can see by making these root hairs like long and thin, you've increased the surface area compared to the volume. And that allows for a greater exchange of materials with the environment. Okay. Um, so in our lungs, if you look at, this is like a, one of those like plastic molds of the inside of human lungs. Um, you look at all of that branching, that's going to increase the surface area for the volume, allowing for a greater gas exchange. Now, this idea, though, of surface area to volume can also be applied to organisms. So here I see two different rabbits. And with these rabbits, you notice that their body shapes and their ears and their legs are different. So in the desert hair, what we notice are these big flat ears. Now that is increasing the surface area 
for evaporative cooling compared to the volume. So by increasing the surface area, it allows for more like space or like area for wind to come and take some of that heat. If you look at the long legs of the hair, a long skinny legs that also, I think they like lick their fur. And then when the like wind comes by, it takes um, that moisture and that heat with it versus the snowshoe hair does can't afford to lose heat to the environment. Therefore, by evolving to have this like round compact shape, um, they have less surface area in con compared to their volume in contact with the cold environment. Therefore, they are like minimizing how much heat is gonna be lost to that environment. Because if you think about, I'm sorry, I should mention, both of these animals, like they're mammals, they're endotherms or warm-blooded, they have to eat food for their mitochondria to break it down and generate heat. So when you talk about like metabolism, um, these animals, especially the snowshoe hare, is gonna have to eat a lot to then um, generate enough heat to stay warm in this cold environment. And therefore, if it loses its heat to the environment, um, it's gonna require more calories to survive. So by evolving to have less of its surface, uh, surface area compared to its volume touching the cold air, it makes it um, better able to survive in that cold uh, location. So you see this again in giraffes and compared to like a walrus. So a current hypothesis scientists are working on is that maybe uh, giraffes evolve these long necks, not necessarily for the leaves at the top of trees, but maybe to increase their surface area compared to their volume for evaporative cooling. Whereas the walrus is gonna have a more compact um, body size. Um, it's evolved to have less of its skin touching the environment. Um, so therefore it tries to conserve its heat um, like deeper inside. Uh, so here if we look at a little tiny, um, this is a little mouse or a shrew or something, compared to the elephant, uh, we can talk about the metabolic rate. So when you see the metabolic rate down here, what that means is it's basically like all of your chemical reactions within your body, like how much uh, cellular respiration are you doing? And if you connect the idea that cellular respiration generates heat for your warm-blooded endothermic animals, um, a little tiny mouse here that has a large, remember, it's like the cells, like a prokaryote versus a eukaryote, a small versus a large cell. So this little mouse here has a very large surface area compared to its tiny, like to its volume. And so with that, that large surface area means that they're losing lots of heat to their environment and therefore their metabolic rate is very high to replace that heat that's lost. So their metabolic rate is very high to generate heat due to their high surface area to volume ratios. Versus the elephant is like um, those large cubes where the elephant has less surface area compared to its volume, except in its ears. And so therefore its metabolic rate is quite a bit slower. It's not losing as much heat to the environment through its like um, surfaces. So metabolic rate ties into this uh, surface area to volume uh, concept as well. And I'm sorry if this video was a little confusing. I think I do a better job in class, but it is one of the topics I kind of struggle with putting into words. So uh, hopefully this video was helpful for you.